I love this Torah portion. It's one of my favorite. As most of you know, it is called Parshat what? Maquettes. And what does maquettes mean? The end. The end. How many of you know we're living in maquettes? The end times. We really are. Uh, I'm very excited about this Torah portion because of the parallels to Yeshua. Let's begin with Genesis chapter 41 and look at verse 1 through 3. And let me say this for the blind people that are watching. They always want me to mention the date. It's 2023, uh, December 16th. Okay, in Genesis 41, 3, 1, 1 through 3, it came to pass at Maquette's, the end of how many years? Two full years. And I'm going to talk about what full means. Two full years, Pharaoh had a dream. And he's standing by the river, and there comes up out of the river seven fat cows. And they were feeding in a meadow, and behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, and they were all sick and skinny, and they stood by the other cows on the brink of the river. Okay, when, what time on the biblical calendar does the year end, the civil calendar? Rosh Hashanah, okay? So when it says the end of two full years, that means from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. We know he had the dream on Rosh Hashanah, okay? Because it's two full years. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at Exodus chapter 23, verse 14 through 16, God tells you that there are three times a year that we have to keep a feast to the Lord. These are known as the regalim or the foot feast because everybody had to physically walk there three times a year. And it says it was the feast of unleavened bread, which is Passover, and you have to eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you. And look at this, in the time appointed at the month of Aviv, which means spring. So this is referring to the spring festival of Passover unleavened bread. And it says, because this is when you came out of Egypt and no one shall appear before me empty. Then the second one it says is the feast of harvest. This is known as Shavuot or Pentecost, which is in the summer. The first fruits of your labors, which you've sown in the field. Now look at the last one. The last one is the feast of ingathering, which is, okay, Passover is the barley harvest in the spring. Summer is the wheat harvest. The fall is the fruit harvest. And it's called the feast of ingathering, ingathering which is when? In the end of the year. So the end of the year is in September, October. Okay, that's when it is the civil calendar. Why? Because on Rosh Hashanah is the very day Adam was created. We're celebrating every year on Rosh Hashanah humanity's birthday, okay? So it's the civil calendar. And notice that is the end of the year. Now we know Passover, Nisan, is the beginning of the year for the religious calendar, okay? The Jews have four calendars. There's four biblical calendars. They don't replace each other. Just like we have a fiscal calendar, a school calendar, or civil calendar. Well, it's the same thing in the Bible. There were different calendars. Uh, they don't do away with each other. But I want you to notice that the fall feast was the end of the year, referring to the civil calendar. And so it is also believed that Pharaoh's, not only Pharaoh's dreams and Joseph's appearance before Pharaoh all occurred on Rosh Hashanah. And you're going to see why. Look at Genesis 41.9. This is further proof that this happened on Rosh Hashanah. It's, this is when the uh, chief butler spoke to Pharaoh and he says, oh, I remember my faults this day. Well, guess what? Rosh Hashanah, like New Year's Day resolutions, you try to remember your faults and you make a New Year's resolution. So here on Rosh Hashanah, we see he's reflecting on his faults. Look at Leviticus 23, 24. 
It says, speak to the children of Israel, saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, which is what day? First day of the month of the seventh month is what day? Come on. First day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. What is it? Rosh Hashanah. That's what we've been talking about. Okay. On the first day of the, you might wonder, well, how come it's the seventh month? Because it's the seventh month of the religious calendar. But it's the first month of the civil calendar. So that, where some of, that might be where some of your confusion was. But the first day of the seventh month is Tishri 1, which is Rosh Hashanah. And look at this. It says, you're to have a Sabbath, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, a holy assembly. Okay, how many of you ever heard of Memorial Day? What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to remember. Well, guess what? Rosh Hashanah is known as a Memorial Day. You're supposed to remember. And what did the butler do? He remembered, and he remembered his faults. Okay, do you remember what it is a memorial of? They call it their Memorial Day. What is Rosh Hashanah a memorial of? Do you remember that? It is the very single, it is the day Abraham was going to offer up Isaac. That's what happened on the first day of Tishri. It is the day Abraham was about to offer up Isaac. And what got caught in the thorn bush or the bush? A ram, which has a ram's horn, which is what you blow on Rosh Hashanah. Make sense? Okay, now, so here we see it's known, Rosh Hashanah is known as the day of remembrance. And the butler remembers Joseph. It also begins the 10 days of repentance to Yom Kippur. And what do we see? He remembers, he repents, he confesses his sin. And what else is Rosh Hashanah known as? The day of the coronation. And what happens to Joseph? He gets coronated as the assistant to the king of Egypt. Look at Genesis 41, 40 and 41. Pharaoh says to Joseph, you're going to be over my house. And according to your word, will all my people be ruled? Only in the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Now, what else is Rosh Hashanah known as? It's known as Yom Hadin. What's Yom? Day. Ha, the, din, judgment. So Rosh Hashanah is known as the day of judgment. As you know, they always say on Rosh Hashanah is when everyone appears before God. God looks at everyone's life. The court in heaven is open and he decides who's going to live and who's going to die this next year. That's what Rosh Hashanah is. Those 10 days before Yom Kippur. And so this is a day of, it could be a judgment for good, could be a judgment for bad. But that's what it is known as. And what happens the butler got judged and the baker got judged. They both had their head lifted. One had it lifted off and the other one had it, you know, raised back to his position. Now, look at Genesis 41, verse 14. Pharaoh sent and he called Joseph, Joseph and they brought him how? Out of the dungeon. Hastily, hurriedly, very quickly. Well, look at Isaiah chapter 56, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, keep you judgment, do justice, for my salvation is near to come. What is the Hebrew word for salvation? Yeshua, that was his name. And he says, my righteousness is going to be revealed. Now, here's what uh, many people say. It is said that just as their redemption from Egypt happened quickly, Okay, here they're all in Egypt. The next thing they know, they're out with all of the goods from Egypt very quickly. Well, they say just as the first redemption from Egypt happened quickly, they couldn't even bake their bread when there was not even time for the dough to rise. It, it will be the same way in the future redemption as well. So in other words, just as quickly as within a day they were gone, the future redemption will be the same way. Matter of fact, Look at Revelation 3.11. Yeshua says, behold, how do I come? Quickly, hold that fast which you have so no one takes your crown. Wow, when do you get crowned? On Rosh Hashanah. Okay, so this event 
the not Saul, the resurrection of the dead, will happen quickly in the twinkling of an eye. And it will happen on Rosh Hashanah. As a matter of fact, look at this. Uh, uh, one sage said, all of God's salvations happen in a moment. As the verse states, look at Malachi 3.1. Behold, I'll send my messenger. He will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek, how will he come? Suddenly, he will suddenly come into his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he will come, says the Lord of hosts. Wow. I don't know if you knew this, but long before the apostle Paul or Rabbi Shaul, there's a popular saying within Judaism that says the salvation of God is like the blink of an eye. That wasn't something Paul came up with. That was something that had been around forever. Uh, it comes from the fact that within the space of just one day, Joseph went from prisoner to president. I mean, it's one thing to go from prisoner to get out of prison. He went from prisoner to president. At the Exodus, Israel went from slavery immediately into freedom. In Hebrew, it's called the heraf ayin. Heraf ayin, the eye, twinkling of an eye. Uh, but it's more than a blink of the eye. This is what's important. When I talk about the twinkling of the eye, most Christians don't know that it's more than that. What it really means is to let your guard down. To let your guard down. Now, why is that important? Uh, also, it could mean to stop looking. In the blink of an eye, when you blink, you stop looking, don't you? How many of you know you just can't let your guard down, but so often we let our guard down? Okay, let me uh, show you this first. So here we go. All of this happened on Rosh Hashanah when he had his dream. Okay, everything is the day of judgment. It's Hadin. Now, watch this. I want you to, Jill, I'm about to have you show the video, but first I'm going to show a slide. Do you see the red triangle? I, can you, I don't know if you can tell it. Or Hey, dim the lights a second. It'll be good to dim the lights anyway for the video, if you can. I don't know if you can see it, but there's two men sitting here. Can you see it in the shadow? No? Well, there's, there's two men sitting here. And what do you see here? A little baby who's about to fall in the water and drown. Now, I want to show you what happened. Oh, but let me say this. This fence is four feet high. How many of you would like to jump over this fence? That ain't happening. Okay. And, and do you see the opening here? If it, this kid fell in the pool, man, I'd be running right through here, wouldn't you? Well, let's watch what happens. Go ahead, Jill. A relaxing day at the pool turns into a freezing moment of pure panic. A little boy walks through the open gate, lured by a colorful beach ball floating in the family pool. His dad is keeping a careful eye and calls out for little Rocco to be careful. Watch, watch. Then, in an instant, the 18-month-old falls in. In a split second, his father turns into Superman. Look at him make a jaw-dropping dive over the four-foot fence. <laughs> straight into the pool, saving <coughs> his little boy. Here it is again. Super Dad leaps over the four-foot fence head first. The dad, Albert Passavanti, who lives in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, says adrenaline kicked in and he suddenly possessed Superman strength to save his son. I spoke to him from China where he's on business. Do you think your athleticism played a part? Anybody would do that. You don't have to have any kind of ability to jump over a fence. You know, it's the kids in trouble. You know, you got to get to them as quickly as you possibly can. What advice do you have for all parents? You just absolutely have to keep an eye on your kids. I don't care what measures you ever put in place. Tragedy can happen. This is what a four foot fence looks like. It was installed by Tom Brino. I'm five foot seven and you can see the height of this fence. It's it's nearly you know, mid chest on me. So for anybody to get over this, he'd either be very strong, very, very good on his feet. The super dad rescue comes with the arrival of summer and all the dangers associated with backyard swimming pools. Just the other day, country singer Granger Smith and his wife Amber opened up about the recent tragic drowning of their son River. We're going to constantly search for um, ways that, that good will come out of this. Luckily, Super Dad was there to save little Rocco.
It's amazing. Something can happen in the blink of an eye. And here's the thing. If you're not ready, you lose the chance to get ready. You've got to be like that, that ready to respond in an instant. And if we're not on God's calendar, if we're focused on other things, we're going to be like the second couple rather than the first couple. And so for me, it's very important that all of us realize how suddenly the redemption is going to come. This is what Paul was drawing on uh, in this, because this concept had already existed where he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, it was in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. The last trump refers to Rosh Hashanah. They blow the shofar 100 times and it's the last blast of Rosh Hashanah that this is gonna happen. So it will happen on Rosh Hashanah some year. It says the trumpet will sound or the shofar and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and will all be changed. That shows you we're all still in diapers. We're all still kids. We're all gonna be changed. Just kidding. Okay, look at Daniel 12, one and two. At that time, Michael is gonna stand up. That's Michael the archangel. He's the great prince, which stands for the children of Israel. And it says there will be a time of trouble. Such as what? Never was. We think there's been troubled times before. This is going to be a time of trouble that is worse than ever. Since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people will be delivered. Hallelujah. Everyone that is found where? Written in the book. And what happens on Rosh Hashanah? It's the opening of the books. This is why this event will happen on Rosh Hashanah. The books will be open. He'll see who's in it. And he says, come on up here. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. You know, uh, and that uh, verse referring to at the shout of God and the shofar of God, that is the word teruah, which means to wake up. Everything points to Rosh Hashanah as the day the resurrection of the dead will take place. Here we are in maquettes, which means the last. And this is talking about the last trump. Well, realize that Joseph was raised up from the pit on Rosh Hashanah. He was in the earth and he rose, okay, from prisoner to president. Now, here's what's interesting. Here is a parallel. You know what I mean by a parallel? This teaches us that Pharaoh's dreams not only speak of what happened at the end of Joseph's last two years of imprisonment, but also what will happen at the end of the last 2,000 years. And we are at the end of the 2,000 years. Uh, at the end of two years, Joseph was exalted as co-ruler over the whole land. And this tells us at the end of the 2,000 years, Yeshua, the son of Joseph, will also be ruler over all the nations of the world. Now, let me just give you a time frame real quick. I want you to notice, and again, this is a year by year. Here, it's in the year 2220 from Adam. Jacob is 112. Joseph is in Egypt. And so here's every year going all the way to the end. And this is when the baker dies on Rosh Hashanah. The butler is restored on Rosh Hashanah. And so I want you to realize that it is this Rosh Hashanah, I mean, if you could take this and make it wider, it was this Rosh Hashanah when all this happened. Jacob is 119, Joseph is 28 in prison. Here are the two years Joseph's in prison, from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. And now Joseph is 30, he's released on Rosh Hashanah, Jacob is 121 years. This is when the seven years of prosperity begin. First, second, third, fourth, fifth. The next week would be the seventh year. Does everyone understand that? Now, what does the one through seven mean? The Shemitah year. This is exactly the first year of a Shemitah cycle. The Shemitah cycle is how many years? Seven. So not only am I giving you the age, I'm giving you the Shemitah cycles. So the at the end of the Shabbat here, 
on that Rosh Hashanah is when all of this happened. So I want you to realize these are a Shemitah cycle. Okay? Now, here's the two years. He was, after he, the baker was raised, but he forgot to tell the king. And so these are the two years that he was forgotten. Okay? Just like the last 2,000 years. Now, right there. You see that? When it says in, your, in our Torah portion, Genesis 41.1, it says at the end of two full years. Here are the two full years. Does everyone see that? Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. See where I'm at here. Okay, now I want you to think of something. This is kind of fun. 20, okay, this year here was a jubilee year. I don't know if you knew that. The year 2022 to 2023 was a jubilee year, which is always the first year of a new Shemitah cycle. The Shemitah year is how long? Seven years. How many sets of seven are there until the jubilee? Seven. Seven times seven is 49. Okay, so seven sets of sevens have gone by, and this is the year of Jubilee, so to speak. Uh, so now, 2022, 2023, I just want you to see a pattern, is right here. That was the Jubilee year. All right, now, 2023, 2024 is what we just celebrated. Okay, Rosh Hashanah of a month ago, or a month and a half ago, was right here. Okay? Now, here is 2024, 2025. We haven't got to actually 2024 yet. So this is referring from here to here. Okay, as far as the Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. (laughs) <laughs> well, here's what's fascinating now. We are entering 2024. This Rosh Hashanah right here is next year's Rosh Hashanah, which is going to be at the end, in the middle of 2024. Everyone understand? September 24 is going to be right here. Next Rosh Hashanah is that there. Could it be that it was at the end of the second year of the Shemitah cycle that Joseph was raised up? Could it be at that Rosh Hashanah of next year we go up? Just a pattern I'm just talking about. It was the second year into the Shemitah week that that happened. Okay, now let's go back to our notes. In Genesis 41, 38, and 39, Pharaoh says to his servants, can we find anyone like this, a man in whom the spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, for as much as God has showed you all of this, there was no one so discreet and wise as you are. And then we find Pharaoh takes off his ring, puts it on Joseph's hand, puts on him all kinds of vestures and fine linen. He puts a gold chain around his neck and he let him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And everyone had to bow the knee before him. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. I think it's interesting that everyone had to bow the knee to Joseph. And Joseph is a type of the Messiah. Look at Philippians 2.10. At the name of Yeshua, every knee should bow. All those things in heaven, on earth, and even under the earth, everyone has to bow the knee to Yeshua. Look at Romans 14, 11. As it is written, and when it says written, it's not referring to the New Testament. It's referring to the Tanakh, okay? It says, as it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee will bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. This is telling us that Yeshua is Lord, Yeshua is God. But where does that verse come from? Look at Isaiah 45, verse 23. Give the word, put forward your cause. Let us have a discussion together. Who has given news of this in the past? 
Who made it clear in early times? Did not I, the Lord? There is no God but who? Me. A true God and a Savior, there is no other. Let your hearts be turned to me so you may have Yeshua or salvation, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is how many other? By myself have I taken an oath. A true word has gone from my mouth. It will not be changed. How many of you know that what God speaks and swears is going to happen? And look what he says. To me, every knee will be bent and every tongue will give honor. This is the verse that Paul is using when he writes that. He's pulling from Isaiah. Now, look at Genesis 41, 45. Pharaoh calls Joseph's name, Zothnot Paneach. What is that? Remember, at every Passover service, the afikoman is hidden, and it's called the safun. It means to hide. And so when it says uh, Zothnot Paneach, it means to hide or to treasure, to encrypt, or one who can explain what is hidden. There are things that are hidden, and then there needs to be someone to explain what is hidden. In other words, the decoder of mysteries. Yeah, at the Passover ceremony, it's called the Safun. Okay, so let's look at Genesis 41, 49, and 50. Joseph gathered grain, like the sand of the sea. When you go to the ocean, you see all the sand on the seashore? That's a lot of sand. And uh, the word for grain there, by the way, is bar. Well, let's look at this. Until he left counting, for it was without number. And to Joseph were born two sons, and it says, before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On, bore unto him. Okay, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest, was not Jewish. Wow. He marries an Egyptian, so not one of his children were even Jewish. Manasseh wasn't Jewish. Ephraim wasn't Jewish. And it doesn't even say if they were ever circumcised even, which is interesting. But they represent the Gentiles grafted into Israel. In Genesis 41, 51 through 53, look at this. Joseph calls the name of his firstborn Manasseh. What does Manasseh mean? Forget it. How would you like to be named forget it? I mean, Joseph was in so much pain, he says here, God has made me to forget all my toil and all my father's house. His brothers made him so hurt, okay, uh, so distressed that he named his first son forget it. I think if I wanted to forget my family, I wouldn't name my son forget it because I'd always remember. <laughs> Why? Okay. In the name of the second, he called Ephraim. Why? Because God has made me fruitful. And what does Ephraim mean? Fruitful, doubly fruitful in the land of my affliction. So even though he's afflicted in Egypt, God has made him fruitful. And then it says, and the years, the seven years of plenty that was in the land of Egypt were macats, ended. And so now comes the seven years of famine. And look what it says in Genesis 42, 1 through 5. And I, I'm going to make the MBV version. You ever heard of the MBV version? The Mark Biltz version. Here it goes. Now Jacob, hearing there was grain in Egypt, said to his sons, why are you staring at your navels? Why are you staring at your belly buttons? You're not accomplishing anything here. And he said, I've had news that there is grain in Egypt. Isn't it interesting? Here you have... All these guys in their 40s, and uh, they're stuck. Why are they stuck? They sold Joseph. They know it. They're guilty. They can't go forward. They are literally stuck. How many of you know sometimes when we experience traumatic events as kids, we get stuck? We just can't go forward. That's what is happening. They're just, they're at a loss. And so Jacob has to kick them in the tuchus. And he says, go down to Egypt and get grain so that life and not death may be ours. So Joseph's 
10 brothers go down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob didn't send Benjamin Joseph's little brother with his brothers. Okay, you think of Benjamin, this little kid, he's not gonna send him. How old is Benjamin at this time that he says this? He's in his 30s and he already has 10 kids of his own. All right. <laughs> in some parents' eyes, the kids never grow up. Okay. And so Benjamin, uh, he didn't send Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, lest perhaps harm happen to him. So the sons of Israel came to buy among those who came, for the famine was in the entire land of Canaan. And so Jacob is basically saying, saying why are you still? staring at yourselves. How do you expect to find a solution just by staring at one another? They were focused inward. And he is basically saying, wake up and do something. Okay, what's interesting, I don't know if you know how many years have gone by since Joseph was sold, but the Torah has not shared a word about the brother's doings, and it's been 20 years. 20 years go by, and the Torah doesn't tell us anything about what his brothers were doing. They were stuck. The brothers, while living in Canaan, they're in the promised land, but they're living in spiritual exile. Joseph is living in a physical exile. So they're both in exile, one spiritually and one physically. Okay? Now, look at Genesis 42, 14 through 18. And Joseph said, it is as I've said, you've come with some secret purpose, but in this way, will you be put to the test by the life of Pharaoh? You're not gonna go away from here until your youngest brother comes. Send one of your number to get your brother and the rest of you will be kept in prison. Okay, so there's 10 brothers. He's saying 10 of you are gonna be kept in prison. One of you gets to go get your brother. So your words could be tested if you're telling the truth. If not by the life of Pharaoh, your purpose is certainly secret. So he put them in prison for... How many days? Three days. And on the third day, Joseph said, okay, do this. I'm a God-fearing man, so we're going to reverse it. I'm going to let nine of you go home and just keep one of you in prison. Okay? So it says in Genesis 42, 19 through 24, if you're true, let one of your brothers be bound in the house of your prison. You go carry corn for the famine of your house, but bring your youngest brother to me. So shall your words be verified and you'll not die. And they did so. And they said one to another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he sought us and we would not hear. There's a time coming. God has, with the anguish of his soul, been calling upon us and we do not hear. Therefore, when we cry out to God, a time is coming, he will not hear. It's a response to us. And then it says, he turned himself about from them and he wept and returned to them again and communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. You know what's fascinating about this? They, didn't, they were probably fighting, who's gonna stay? Who's gonna stay? They probably could make up their mind. So Joseph goes and he grabs Simeon. What does Simeon's name mean? To hear. He took hearing from them because they would not hear. Romans eleven eight. 8, according as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this day. Well, last verse here, almost. Genesis 42, 27 and 28. Here they go and look, they open up their sack to give their donkey food and they saw their money back in the bag. It was in the sack's mouth. And he said to his brothers, my money is restored. And look, it's even in my sack. And their heart filled them. And they were afraid, saying, what is this that God has done to us? That word afraid there literally means to shudder with terror. I mean, they were just shuddering with terror. And then in Genesis 42, 37 and 38, does this sound, sound like a, a real faithful man here? Reuben, the oldest, says to Jacob, kill my two sons if I don't bring them back to you. You think I want to kill my two grandkids? Are you nuts? 
If you're willing to kill your own two sons, do you think I'm going to put my grandson in your hands? You're nuts. And he says, uh, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> he says, my son's not going down with you. And then over time, look what happens in Genesis 43, 8 and 9. Now Judah comes and he says to Israel, his father, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also all of our little ones. And then Judah says, I will be surety for him. My hand shall you require him. If I bring him not to you and set him before you, let me bear the blame forever. I think that's kind of amazing because Yeshua be, uh, from the tribe of Judah is the one who said, I will be surety. I will be the one to go get him. And he's the one who bore our blame forever. And then in Genesis 44, 12, he searched and began at the eldest and left at the youngest and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. So they rent their clothes. What's interesting, Judah is the one who rent Joseph's coat when they threw him in the pit to make it look, and stained it with blood to make it look like he was eaten. Isn't that fascinating? And when it says they rent their clothes, that's a sign of mourning, okay? And then they took that coat to Jacob, and what did he do? Rent his clothes. It's a sign of mourning, a broken heart. In Judaism, it's called Korea, K-E-R-I-A-H. Well, guess what? When Messiah died, the veil of the temple was rent, which was God tearing his garment, mourning over the death of his son. With that, let's stand. We'll close with a prayer, and then uh, feel free to go down, and we're going to have a break for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have worship for about 15 minutes, and then we'll jump into the second half. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father King, we just thank you so much uh, for giving us all these patterns. Father, we truly want to learn from you. Give us a heart that is not stony, that is not filled with weeds, but a heart that is open to receive from your word. We thank you so much for everything that you're doing in our lives. And Father, right now, I just want to thank you for all those that are here locally, for all those around the United States and around the world. Father, that... Uh, help support your ministry. Your, it's your ministry using us to take the Torah all over the world to all these nations. We know the end is near. And Father, uh, we just want to build relationships with you and get your children to turn back to you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. We're so glad to have all of you here. Okay, I'm going to kind of start a series now, and it's going to be going through the Gospels, but going deeper into them. Okay, looking at it more from a Hebraic perspective. Um, let me see. Here's one of the, my little pictures. Uh, how many of you know the Bible says we need to search the scriptures? Very important. And what we want to do is we're going to dig deeper. We're going to dig as deep as we can. We don't want to just touch the surface. We want to dig deep into the word of God. So let's start with John 1, 1, verse through verse 5. In the beginning was what? The Word. When you think of the Word, you think of something spoken or written. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Wow. When you think of the Word was God too, you think of God speaking a word. And when you think of in the beginning was the word, that almost could be in the beginning was the Torah. Some people believe the Torah came first, before all the events. It's almost like you write a play and then people act it out. 
And some people think that the whole Torah was written first, and then God put the play into motion, and people were acting out what he already wrote. That's an interesting thought. And then it says, the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light. Wow, someone's life is the light. And what God, does God call us to do? He wants our life to be a light. But it also says the word is a hymn. Isn't that interesting? And now the word becomes personified. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. I can't think, help but think of Genesis 1, 1, it was all darkness. And then he brought light into that darkness. And that's just not physical darkness, that's moral darkness. And then look at Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And what was on the face of the earth? Darkness was on the face of the deep. And then it says, the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now look at Isaiah 11 too. It talks about the spirit of God moving on the waters. And here it says, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Who's the him here? We have the spirit, we have the Lord, and it says it's going to rest on him in Isaiah. It says the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Well, what do you think Paul was talking about when he wrote the book of Colossians? Look at the seven spirits of God. It says, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, don't cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will, all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you would walk worthy of the Lord to all pleasing, and you're going to be fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, and unto all patience and longsuffering and joyfulness, giving thanks to the Father, which has made us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And look at this, he delivered us from the power of darkness. Wow, what do you think that means? I mean, how does darkness without light, how does that have any power? You know, if you want power, you turn on the light switch and the darkness is gone. But how many of you know of moral darkness that has a strong power over people that needs to be overcome? That's why it says he's translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And then it says, who is the image of the invisible God? So we have the invisible father whom no one can see and Yeshua becomes his image. And then it says, by him... Where was everything created in heaven, in earth, visible, invisible, whether they're thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers? And here it comes. All things were created by him and for him. He is before everything, and by him all things consist. So we see Yeshua existed long before any of creation. Now, in Hebrew, the word uh, bereshit, which means in the beginning, okay, reshit, if you get rid of the B and have reshit, reshit basically is the first, like the first fruits, but reshit is also a Hebrew name for the Messiah because Messiah is the first fruits, right? So when you look at reshit, meaning the Messiah, the letter bait can mean the word by or for. So the phrase in the beginning could also be translated as by the Messiah, for the Messiah, through the Messiah. And that's what this is talking about in Colossians. By him, he's saying Breshit, by him, for him, through him, everything happened that did 
happen. And then look at this, John 1, 10 and 11. He was in his own world. The world was even made by him and the world did not know him. He came unto his own and his own received him not. I can't help but think of uh, the song you guys were just, you know, singing. How so humbly he came. He's the one who created the world. I have their Brishit bara Elohim, Hashemayim Be'et Haaretz, with the et in the middle. He is the word of God. He created the earth, bringing it out of the water. He's holding it in his hands. And then he decided to come and visit his own creation. And his own creation didn't even recognize him. I, I can't help but think of uh, the next verse, Isaiah 1, 2, and 3. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Now, did God create the heavens and the earth? Okay. So he's talking to his own creation. And it says, the Lord has spoken. I've nourished and I've brought up kids, and they've rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doesn't know. My people don't even consider that I'm their creator. And so here, he humbly, he comes to this earth, his own creation, and his own creation doesn't recognize him. How many of you have ever owned a dog? Does the dog recognize you when you come home? And that's the point. Here God comes home and nobody even recognizes him. Why don't they recognize him? They haven't had a relationship with him. I mean, uh, what, what was it? I saw this one, you know, one of these stupid TV shows called Court TV or something. Or who's that famous judge, lady, Judge Judy? I don't know what it is. But anyway, it's one of those type of shows. And uh, these two ladies... Uh, claim the same, uh, they own the same dog, you know. And so it's my dog. No, it's my dog. Well, someone came in and dropped the dog down and the dog ran to the owner and the judge says, case closed, we know who it is, you know. Well, I, I think it's fascinating that here God created us and he comes to us and we don't recognize him. And this reminds me again of Joseph, a type of the savior, okay, his own brothers didn't recognize him. And why didn't they recognize him? He looked Egyptian. He was dressed like an Egyptian. And then the church says today, why don't the Jews recognize Jesus? Is because you're serving him an Egyptian Jesus. How can the Jews recognize the Jesus who's changed the language, wants nothing to do with Torah? We be, I mean, the Passover He's got loaves of bread all over the table in the pictures, and it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the church wonders why the Jews don't recognize him. You're not presenting an authentic Jewish Yeshua. That's why. And look at Psalm 33, 6. You know, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. And here it says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. I mean, look how big this sun is. God breathes out stars. And look at this. In Proverbs 3, this is verse 19 and 20. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. Here we see three of the seven spirits of God, right? or actually four of the seven spirits of God mentioned. This is a mind-blowing verse in Psalm 8, verse 22 and 23. The Lord possessed me. Who is me here? The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth even was. That I refers to wisdom, but that refers to the Spirit of God and Messiah. And then John 1.14 is so incredible because it says, the Word was made flesh. Do you know what the Torah is made on? It's made on flesh. It's lambskin. And he was the Lamb of God. And so here the Torah, the Word of God was put into flesh. And then it says, he dwelt among us. That means to tabernacle. That's what the Feast of Tabernacles is about because that is when Yeshua was born on the Feast of Tabernacles. And then it says, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, 
full of two things. What are they? And why is that? Well, if you remember back in Exodus, it says we beheld his glory, okay, full of grace and truth. In Exodus 33, 18, Moses says, show me your glory. Well, Exodus 34, 6, it says the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, and here we go. Here's the gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. And so John 1, 14 got that from Exodus 34, 6. Now, here's a verse that is so often misinterpreted in every English Bible because English is so bad. It says in John 1, 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Guess what? The word but in every Bible is in italics because it wasn't in the Greek. They decided to add that but, and therefore it sounds like, wow, Moses brought the law, but Yeshua brings grace and truth. No, grace and truth were mentioned in the law, okay? What it's saying is the Torah gave us Moses, and the Torah mentions the grace and the truth and the long suffering and abundance and goodness, and it says grace and truth came by Yeshua. Think of it this way. You love somebody, right? Would you rather send them an email or come and visit them? That's the difference. One came through the Torah where you could read it, but the other one came to give you a big hug. It's not that uh, the one is done away with, okay? It's just a matter of, wow, I got the love letter and I got my lover at the same time. Okay, look at Exodus 25 uh, or Exodus 40, verse 34. It talked about a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. How many of you would like to see the glory of the Lord? You know, the glory of the Lord appeared three times in the Bible. Who can tell me what the three times were that the glory of the Lord appeared? Anyone can tell me all three? When you think you know all three, raise your hand. Go ahead, keep thinking. Anybody think to know the three times? Okay. I will tell you. The three regalim, the three feasts. Passover in Exodus. Pentecost in the book of Acts. And that Solomon's temple was dedicated at the Feast of Tabernacles. So the glory appears at the feast, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. And I'm hoping someday the glory appears again. Okay, let's go to uh, Exodus 25, 8 again. God said, let them make me a dwelling place that I can dwell among them. Did you know that's a wrong translation? It's supposed to be, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell within them. He wants to dwell within us. Now look at John 1, 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. Now, that word declared means to put him on exhibition. In other words, he he was the image of the living God, which is why when the disciples said, show us the Father, he says, basically, you're looking at him. I am the image of the Father. Now, this is fascinating. In Revelation 1, 12 through 16, again, written by John, There's a voice speaking to him, and he turns to see the voice, and being turned, what did he see? Seven golden candlesticks. So here we go. I've got the seven golden candlesticks right there. And then it says, in the midst of the seven candlesticks was one likened to the Son of 
man. He was clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with the golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as the sun that shineth in his strength. Now, uh, here it says, right in the middle was this flame. You got all these flames here. What I, anyone know what I have there in Hebrew? Yeah, right in the middle is the Aleph Tav, but does anybody know what the rest of this says? Yes, Bereshit, bara Elohim, et Hashemayim, et Haaretz. In the beginning, created God, the heavens and the earth. How many words are there? There are seven words. And how many lamps in a menorah? Seven. And what's in the middle? One likened to the Son of Man, who is the Aleph Tav. Yeshua is the Aleph Tav. So John, who wrote, in the beginning was the word. Here you have... In the beginning, when, you, when I say a dictionary from A to Z, I'm talking about every word in the dictionary. Well, here is the word from Aleph to Tav, which is like our A to Z. And the, what you could read this as is, in the beginning created God, the Hebrew alphabet. Everything from A to Z, from Aleph to Tav, the word. And Yeshua is the word, and he is the Aleph Tav. What I think is interesting is here in John, he's talking about this voice he heard in Revelation that had the sound of many waters. Any of you ever been to the ocean and hear the roar of the ocean, the waters? Well, look at, Revel look at Ezekiel, I mean. In Ezekiel 43 verse 2, it's talking about the glory. Behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east, and the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters and the earth shone with his glory. So we see the glory tied to the sound of many waters as he speaks. Well, now let's go to Revelation 14 too. A voice from heaven comes to my ears like the sound of great waters, the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which came to me was like the sound of players playing on instruments of music. Can you imagine worship team a voice that sounds like all these instruments playing at one time? I can hardly wait to hear Yeshua sing. I mean, oh my gosh. I can't even carry a tune in a bucket. But I just think it's amazing. I, I had to read this a couple of times. His voice was like the sound of players playing on instruments, plural, of music. Think about that worship team. A voice that sounds like an orchestra. Let's go to Revelation 1, 17 through 19. John sees him, and he fell on his face at his feet as a dead man. And then he lays his right hand on me, and it says unto me, Don't fear, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the first and the last. Now, how many first and last can there be? One first, one last, and this is again a verse that proves Yeshua is God and the Messiah. It says, I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which you've seen and the things which are and the things which will be hereafter. So we had to write the past, the present, and things that are going to happen in the future. So let's go back to John 1, 19 through 22. It says, and this is the witness of John. That's John the Baptist or John the Mercer. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to him with one big question, they go to John the Baptist and they say, who are you? Now, I think you already knew he was John the Baptist. When they said, who are you? In other words, who do you think you are? And John the Baptist said quite openly and straightforwardly, I'm not the Messiah. 
And they said to him, well, if you're not the Messiah, what are you? Are you Elijah? And he said, nope. Then they said, are you the prophet? And he says, nope. When they say, are you the prophet, what are they referring to? I heard someone back there say it. Let's take a look. Uh, Then he says, I'm not. And then they said to him, well, who are you? We have to give some answer to those who sent us. What do you to say about yourself? Well, the reason why they said Elijah and the prophet, if you look at Malachi 4, 5, the Lord says, I'm sending you Elijah the prophet before the day of the Lord comes. That great day greatly to be feared. All right. So they were wondering if he was Elijah based on this verse. But he wasn't necessarily Elijah because he wasn't coming on the great day to be feared. He was coming on the great day of his coming, first coming. Well, then look at Deuteronomy 18, 18 and 19. God says, I will give them a prophet without a name from among themselves like you. I'll put my words in his mouth and he will say to them, whatever I give him orders to say and whoever doesn't give ear to my words, which he will say in my name will be responsible to me. That's why they ask, are you Elijah? Then they ask, are you the prophet referring to this? And he says, nope, I'm none of those. And then look what happens in John 1, 29 and verse 30. This is another powerful verse showing Yeshua's divinity. The day after, John sees Jesus coming to him and he says, see, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, let me ask you something. Who was born first, John the Baptist or Jesus? John the Baptist was born first. Okay, and look what this says. This is he of whom I said, one is coming after me, who was put over me because he was in existence before me. Hello, right there, he's telling you, I was born before him and he comes after me, but he exists before me. And then look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 2 through 6. Now, when John had news in prison of the works of the Messiah. So here's John the Baptist. He's in prison and he's hearing the works that Jesus does. Remember, they're like first cousins. He sent his disciples to say to him, are you the one who's coming or are we waiting for another? Now, have you ever wondered about that? You ever wondered how can John the Baptist have made all this testimony about he's the one, and then he says, so tell me, are you the one or is there another? Does anyone know why he asked? Many people think it's because he lacked faith. Totally wrong. He didn't lack any faith. The Jews have always believed in two messiahs, one a suffering servant, one a conquering king. And John the Baptist in jail says, are you the conquering king or or are you the suffering servant? You know, if you're the suffering servant, then the conquering king has yet to come. So he knew he was the Messiah, but he didn't know which Messiah. He didn't realize that Yeshua is both and there's two comings. See, the Jews believe in one coming and two Messiahs. We believe in two comings and one Messiah. So what John, he doesn't have a lack of faith. He's about to get his head chopped off. (laughs) And he says, are you the one that's going to get me out of here? (laughs) Basically. All right. So he's not doubting that he's the Messiah. He's just questioning because he thinks there's going to be two Messiahs. They can't imagine how a Messiah could come. They read Isaiah 53 and all these other ones. There's the suffering servant who dies. But then they also read in Daniel, well, there's one who's coming on the clouds with all the power of the Messiah. And so that's why they always thought there were two messiahs, okay? They didn't see two comings. They see two different messiahs. One dies and the other is the conquering king. But that's why he said that, so you know. It's not because he was lacking faith. Oh, and then he goes and he says, now, um, he says, who is to come or are we waiting for another? And how does Jesus answer? He said, okay, go and give news to John of the things which you are seeing and hearing. The blind are seeing Those who were not able to are now walking. Lepers are made clean. Those who were without hearing now have their ears. Oh, no. 
whoever gave me these notes didn't give me the last page. Let me see your notes for a second here. <clears throat> okay. There we are over here. And well, it end with Matthew 11, 2 through 6. Okay. Um, the dead come to life again, and the poor have the good news given to them, and a blessing will be on him who has no doubts about me. Uh, so I really believe that he's saying, especially when it comes to the healing of the lepers, no leper had ever been cleansed in Israel. None. And so now the lepers are being cleansed. And one of the names of the Messiah was going to be the leper Messiah, because he was the one that was going to heal the leper. So he knows he's the Messiah. And now look at John 1, 33 and 34. It says, I had no knowledge who he was, but he who sent me to give baptism with water said to me, the one on whom you see the spirit coming down and resting, it is he who gives the baptism with the Holy Spirit. This I saw myself and witnessed that he is the son of who? Okay, John the Immerser knew, uh, well, and jo the Apostle John knew that he was the Son of God. But look at Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. And it's a question, and it's supposed to be meant as a quiz. Who ascended up into heaven or descended? Who gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who established all the ends of the earth? And then it says, what is his name and what is his son's name, if you can tell? So here we see there's a God and there's a son of God. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 2, verse 12, it says, you better kiss the son, lest he becomes angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So here we see there is a son of God. But look at Daniel. This is chapter 7. Verse 13 and 14, Daniel in a, sees in a night vision and behold, one like the son of who? Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. And look at this, was given, what was given to him, but dominion and glory and kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which won't pass away. And his kingdom, one that will never be destroyed. So here we see someone coming with the clouds of heaven, but it's the son of man who's coming with the clouds of heaven. Now look at Psalm 89, 18, when it talks about the yud heh vav -Hey, they say our breastplate is the Lord and our king is the Holy One of Israel. So the Lord is the king of Israel and he is the Holy One of Israel. But now, this is incredible. This is John 1, 49 through 51. We see both titles in these verses. Nathaniel says to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are king of Israel. Here it just got done saying that Yahweh is the king of Israel. And now in John 1, he's saying to Yeshua, you are the king of Israel. You are the son of God. And look how Jesus answers. You have faith because... I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. You're going to see greater things than this. And he said to him, truly, I say to every one of you, you will see heaven opening and God's angels going up and coming down upon the son of man. So here he's the son of God. He's the son of man. He's, he's both in one. And so that's what he's truly God and he's truly man. And this is what is amazing to me. Again, can you imagine how many of you, and this is really absurd question, but you created dogs. Would you become a dog to help save the dogs? I mean, think of God himself, the king of the universe who created everything, humbles himself so low just to become like his children. I mean, the song you guys sing, he humbled himself. I mean, can you th if anyone's going to be full of pride, it would be God. And that reminds me of another verse, Micah 6, 6 through 8. 
It says, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. To do what? Do justly and actually love being merciful. Sometimes when we're merciful, we don't love it. Well, we have to do it. He loves being merciful. And then it says, and walk humbly, not in front of your God, walk humbly with your God. We serve a humble God. How horrible for a God who so humbles himself to come among us and then a proud man walks before him like he's just something else. How, what absurdity. And for me, the greatest thing I think that would drive anyone to the Lord is God's humility and his mercy and his love. If that doesn't drive you to run toward him, I think people run away from him because they don't know him. They don't know him. But that's because the church has been presenting God like Thor, who throws lightning bolts at the people down below. If you think you're going to get people to heaven by preaching hellfire and brimstone, never, 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 never. You show a God who is loving and merciful, and they'll come a running. But with that, let's stand. We got to show more compassion. We got to show more compassion. We really do. I mean, one of the things that is the main source of anger is pride. It really is. We think we're better than someone else, so we can yell and scream at them. I mean, that's just, sometimes the emotional damage is worse than the physical damage. And so we really have to be careful with our words. We have to become more loving, more compassionate. And that, what did Yeshua say? They'll know your mind by your anger. No, I don't think so. It's by your love. <sighs> Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much that you do love us so much. We know you're the great judge, but we also know that you're our Abba. We know you don't make excuses for sin and everyone will be held accountable. But Father, I just pray that people will get to know the real you and who you are and what a wonderful, humble God you are, that they would truly run to you and not from you. You already know everything about us. And we just thank you that you not only want to bless us, you want to put your name on us. Oh God, may we carry your name honorably. And I can't help but think of what you told Moses to tell Aaron to say this prayer over your people, in which case you not only would bless them, but you would put your name, the Aleph Tav, upon them. And this is what you told him to say. Ivarekaka Adonai Ishmareka, Ya'er Adonai Panav Yelecha V'Chuneka. You saw Adonai Panav Yelecha V'Yasem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that most wonderful name, Eye, Asher, Eye. Amen. And go in peace. Bless one another as you go.